Now, for his own safety, Victor Lewis-Smith has been walled up in another part of Broadcasting House. Are you there, Victor? Uh, not quite all there, Ned, but they say if they drill into the soft spot of my cranium, it'll re release the pressure. The Ned. question on everybody's lips, Victor, is what happened to your pet whippet? Well, as you know, Ned, it started to get better ratings than me, so I ripped open its ribcage, the fragrant ribcage, scooped out its innards and fed them to its own puppies. It's a fictional whippet, so you can't get me on that one. You do good as at the RSPCA, all right? Oh, oh it, it, it's browning in the toaster. It'll pop up in a trice. That's one trice, so that's three jiffies to you, Nerin. <laughs> Done to a turn. <laughs> this week, Nerin, with BBC cutbacks in mind, the chief of BBC Rubbermen, my close friend and toy boy, Mr Marmalade Butty, has decided to cut away all the loose ends deadwood, leading only the intellectual content of the programme intact. So from next week, loose ends will be a three-and-a-half-minute programme. And, as Mr Butty's time-and-motion hatchet man, I'm in charge of reorganisation, or as we say in the BBC, the sacking. <laughs> I leave my luxury York flat on Thursday and head towards Broadcasting House on my powerful rally tricycle with Kiddies stabilizers. Leader of the pack. It sounds like a 1000cc BMW. Leader of the, the secret pack. is jam a lolly stick into the spokes, an old Hell's Angel trick I picked up from Rene Houston, star of the petticoat line. Baby, get on down. I break outside Broadcasting House. I snap in half and green stuff comes out of my ears. <laughs> Luckily for me, Margaret Howard is in the foyer, interviewing Motorhead for Radio 1's heavy metal programme. She sees my plight and puts my mainspring back together with her puncture repair kit. I tricycle into the lift. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, boys. Thank you. Stop it. Stop it. Shove it. Stop it. Stop it. Shove it. And in a jiffy, I'm on the seventh floor. <laughs> All BBC corridors are equipped with tenoys which deliver uplifting music and messages to employees. Ding dong. Here is a BBC Rubber Truth announcement. The following people have been unpersoned. They no longer exist. They have never existed. They are Sue McGregor, Monty Modlin, Mariah Aitken, and Mrs. Tribley and the Whippet. Wibble wobble. <laughs> Suddenly, I notice the producer of Noel Edmonds' Away Day programme hurtling along the pneumatic tube that leads to the evaporation centre. Noel Edmonds' producer doesn't exist either. <laughs> oh dear, now where could it be? I'll just try... Uh, I search for the loose ends office. office. This sound effect of a door opening. <laughs> unfortunately, that was the food programme. I try the next door. Yeah, unfortunately, it was the, it was the food programme. I try the next door. <laughs> Discharge. It's the woman's hour office. Discharge. How do you spell discharge? Over in the corner, Sue McGregor is being forcibly embalmed. Two women wearing only plus fours are admonishing each other with leather thongs, and in the corner, someone is interviewing Al Reed. Discharge. Dead? On woman's hour, it makes no difference. Still searching for loose ends, I ask directions from the in touch office. Come in. Excuse me, do you know where the loose ends people hang out, please? You know, they're all modern and young and yeah. crap and, and sort of run by some old trooper with a deaf age. Oh, yeah, I'll take you, no problem oh, at no, all. No, 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 please, don't, don't put yourself out. No, no trouble, I'll just get me stick. No. Oh, oh, God, no, no, please, no. no. I'll take you, it's all right. It's just around the corner. It's not just around the corner. No, it is. It's just it's around the corner. 30 minutes later, blood pouring from my ears and my clothes in tatters, we find ourselves on the central reservation of the M1 just north of Luton. Right. Take, no, let me have your stick. Just around the corner. Give me your stick. No, really. Give me your stick, will you? Listen, give me your stick. I persuade him to throw in the towel and we lunch. I buy him the pate. It's lovely, that is beautiful, that but is But it's actually lovely. cat food. He knows nothing. I'm a vicious swine. <laughs> 30 minutes later, that's about 15 imperial trices, or in metric, 500 shakes of a cat's tail, I locate the loose ends office. It's Friday evening, the joint is jumping, Mr Guardhouse is fine-tuning tomorrow's masterpiece. <laughs> mm. And Uncle Shednerin has cornered the programme mm. secretary. Good morning! Now listen to this for comedy. That was the week that was. Now that's comedy. So Good morning. To allocate to an office full of grown men and women a week to turn out a chat show just doesn't give them enough to occupy their minds. Let me explain in ergonomic terms. No matter how glitzy and street cred they make it, Loose Ends is essentially a chat show. And like all chat shows, it is essentially crap. But it is very cheap crap, so Head Rubber says, let's have more boys. There are two types of chat show guests, good talkers and bad talkers. Good talkers are very expensive and appear on Wogan. Radio is skint, stuck with the rabbits and the turkeys, and can only get the likes of Geoffrey Archer under certain conditions. 
each loose ends guest this morning got up at 5 a.m. to be here and will receive a cup of coffee, a 42 pound fee, and not a penny more, not a penny less. Why are they here? Answer to plug. I mean, if you describe the book in its short form, well, it's a comic book. The book that goes with the exhibition is called The Secret Serialist. The opening night in Bath. The naked ape and went on through men watching my other books. Another old BBC chat show maxim is that anyone who has been to Oxbridge is bound to mention it at least once in the first 23 minutes and 42 seconds. Listening this morning, the fragrant Mr Archer mentioned his college, Brazenose, precisely 7 minutes and 50 seconds into the programme. Brazenose. <laughs> It is Saturday, 8 a.m. before the guests have arrived. Head of Rubber Talk briefs the nice Mr. Guardhouse and his staff about this morning's mission. Uh, I'll do the next take, Wind. Now, I don't mind telling you, we're up against some pretty bloody ugly customers this morning. Look out for that archer chappy. Don't mention back, spotty or otherwise. Uh, we've got that jumped-up zookeeper, Johnny Morris. I think he used to run the chimp tea party or something. It looks like they're painting his pictures now, but there you are. And uh, we've got some friend of Liberace. Yeah. Regulars, we've got Emma Freud. Saw you on the goggle box, dearie. Stick to the radio. You've got the face for it. Know what I mean? Meanwhile, in the studio, the pianist Eric Hamelin is rehearsing. He plays badly. And, uh, oh, this is no good. I'm going to the John. Five seconds Five to seconds go. To One, two. It's only seconds to go before we're on the air. And there are still a few thousand gremlins in the works. Ned. One, two. Ned. One, two. One, two. One, two. One, two. One, two. One, two. <laughs> But the studio manager has some magic powder too. Some BBC regulation issue fairy dust, which he sprinkles over the microphones to make everything sound nice again, Ned. Hello. This was, of course, the week of the new realism. As yesterday's men gathered in Blackpool, Mr Norman... What you hear is Ned's monologue, beefed up with dubbed laughter, as it will appear in the nighttime repeat. That's the magic of radio. So back to you in a trice, Ned. That's one trice, that's equal to five ticks, or 17 half moves, or in ontological terms, that's about no time at all, really. <laughs> Anybody want the right to reply to Well, I must quicker? say, I had absolutely no idea this was a plug show, so I'd like to say that I missed <laughs> telling you it was beyond reasonable doubt. It's at the Queen's <laughs> Theatre. It opens next week. Ron, Please come. You, you might... You